Okay. We are back for another week in 2 Samuel. Hopefully things aren't too confusing, although last week was a little tough with a lot of nations, a lot of kings, a lot of places, a lot of regions. Um, I know that uh, the, the map that I was trying to show everyone was put up on the YouTube channel, so people on the channel uh, have the have the ability to uh, see that map for that teaching, which is good. Uh, thank my dear friend Joe for doing that. So tonight we move on to chapter nine. It only has 13 verses, but you all know 13 verses can take me weeks potentially. So, uh, but no, we're going to cover the whole all 13. Uh, tonight as we go on. So let me, uh, let me pray first for our, our time tonight. Lord, thank you for your spirit who is always present. We listen to him at times. We miss his voice at times, but he always speaks uh, of you, Jesus. And he also is the one who works on our soul and our spirit, who enlightens us, who opens our mind to spiritual things. And that's what we're praying tonight, that, that the Holy Spirit will open our mind uh, as we go through these verses, and he will enlighten us, that we can gain understanding through it. Pray these things again in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's read the first eight verses, and we'll take them at your mind. That's uh, 2 Samuel 9. Let me start. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. Verse 3. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to him, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from the area of Lodibar. And uh, Mabithosheth, as we easily say his name, okay, mm-hmm. the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, uh, uh, Mabithosheth, and he said to him, here, you, here, you, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will store you and all the land of which your grand, of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. And again, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should guard a, a dead dog like me? Okay, now. You know, one of the things that I think we hopefully learn when we study scripture is that when we look at the things that it says and the verses we read, we have to use the annotations and cross references because they will tell us so much more. If we don't look at those things, then we don't see a bigger story and learn more information about the text that we're studying. And so that's true of tonight also. Now notice that like chapter eight was, chapter eight was not really set chronologically because it was summary of the wars of David, okay? In the same way, we don't know the exact time of this interaction, of this event. It, it's, we don't know where it falls exactly in the reign of David, okay? It's just another event that occurs that is recorded for our benefit that we therefore read and we learn from. We think that it is associated with 
actually chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, and I'll show you why a lot of people think that it is in a minute, okay? Now, <clears throat> now I want you to notice there is a repetition of a word here, and it's important you see the importance. Interestingly enough, it said three times. You know what it is when you read it? It's in verse 1, it's in verse 2, and it's in verse 7. The house of Saul. Nope. Kindness. Kindness. Mm -hmm. Kindness. Mercy. Kindness. Mm -hmm. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Okay? <clears throat> it is the word in Hebrew that in English we translate kindness or unmerited favor or we'll more commonly call it grace. grace. That's the word. And this chapter is about chesed. It's about kindness, unmerited favor. And so we need to understand that as we read this whole thing. Now, let's go back for a moment to 1 Samuel 20, and then we'll go ahead a little bit to 2 Samuel 21. But let's go back to 1 Samuel 20. I just want you to remember Though we studied this, I want you to remember this event because you can't understand what's going on if you don't remember this. All right, and we're going to start in verse 13 of 1 Samuel 20. Okay, he says, um, he says, it, if, you, if it please my father to do you harm, this is Jonathan speaking, okay? May the Lord do, do so to Jonathan and to himself, or more also, uh, if I do not make it known to you, that's he's talking to David, to send you away that you may go in safety. And may the Lord w be with you as he, has, as he has been with my own father. And if I am still alive, will you not show me loving kindness of the Lord? So Jonathan is saying, if I still, if I survive, won't you show me God's kindness? Because he knows David's going to be king. Mm -hmm. That's very evident to him. Okay. Um, and he says, verse 15, and you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Okay? So, this was the promise that occurred between David and Jonathan. Jonathan promised to protect David, and if the story goes on, you remember that he shoots the arrow in one direction, or if he didn't, he would shoot it in the other direction, it would tell David what to do based on what Saul's intent is at this point. Of course, his intent was to kill him again. So he signaled him so that David could take off. And that was the last time David was ever in any way part of the house of Saul in his, uh, in his monarchy there. But he also asked David to do the same for him, that he, if he lived, or any of his descendants would be protected by, by David. So we get this promise, and that's why when we turn back to our text and we talk about this guy, uh, Methibosheth, he is the son of Jonathan. I mean, he, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. he's the son of Jonathan. We learn that he's also lame. He's disabled. But so he asked, David's asking this question at this point based on, I presume undoubtedly, what the Holy Spirit put on his mind. Is there anyone left in the house of Saul? And this is who's left. Okay, now I want to also go back to, um, so let, let's reiterate here. So D David promises kindness to be shown. Now also, we already saw something else, and it was just a few chapters ago. If you go back in 2 Samuel chapter 4, that's another place where we previously had learned about this young man 
or so. We think, well, maybe he's young, maybe he's closer to middle age at this point. We don't know exactly. Uh, name uh, Mabithasheth. And it's in ch uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Now, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a, crippled, uh, uh, had a son crippled in his feet. And he was five years old when, he, uh, when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that uh, in her hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mabithasheth. Okay. So here we also were told earlier about who this person was when he was a little boy of age five and the event that caused him to probably, we believe, have a spinal cord injury. It's probably why he was lame, crippled. Okay, now, <clears throat> now let's turn back in 2 Samuel towards the end to what I believe and many people believe was going on around this time, okay? We don't know exactly when, but around this time. And that is in, it's in the 21st chapter. And we're going to read <clears throat> verses 1 through 7. Okay? So, verse 1. There was a famine in these days, in the days of David, and it occurred for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, it is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for, quote, the sons of Israel and Judah. Now, what he's referring to is the story first in Joshua chapter 9. You don't have to go there necessarily, but you can note it if you want to. It's verses 3 through 27. It's a story that when they came into this area where the Gibeonites lived, now the Gibeonites, we learn in Joshua, were not originally of this part of Israel. They probably, well, undoubtedly, they were actually outside of it, probably. They were Gentiles. And, of course, what was the rule, the ban, the holy war that was declared by God in coming in in the conquest? What would God tell them to do over and over and over and over and over again? Don't do it with other nations. Exactly. Don't make a treaty with other nations. These nations are not meant to be there. It's a holy war. They're infested with, with giant peoples, and you have to get rid of them. Okay? But the Gibeonites were <clears throat> crafty, and they went to elaborate means, <clears throat> even in how they treated their shoes and aged their bread, if I remember the story right, mm -hmm. to give the impression that they weren't from, originally, any part of Israel. And so they claimed to be, you know, sojourners that came through. So... They, uh, I'm sorry, Joshua gave them peace. And they ended up asking for an agreement of peace, which Joshua gave them. Now, later it was found that they lied to Joshua. That they were not, they should have been exterminated with the rest. So Joshua decided that because he'd given the oath, he couldn't take back the oath. They will be servants. Right, so they would be servants, woodcutters, carriers of water, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so they continued to live at peace, though they were the servants of Israel, for all these years since the time of Joshua to the time of Saul. But Saul, being the spiritual giant that he was, as we've learned all the way through 1 Samuel, apparently had no idea about this treaty. And certainly if he did, he didn't honor it and decided to try to get rid of the Gibeonites. So he slaughtered a bunch of them. That's what's being talked about here in 2 Samuel 21. So we pick up in verse 3, thus David said to the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? And how can I make atonement 
that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. Then the Gibeonites said to him, we have no concern for silver or gold with Saul or his household, nor is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, I will do for, for you whatever you say. Verse five, so they said to the king, the man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us remaining within any border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us and we will hang them before the Lord uh, in Gibeah of Saul and the chosen of the Lord, who was the, who was the chosen of the Lord. And the king, that is David, said, I will give them to you. Verse 7, but the king spared Mabithasheth, the son of Jonathan, the, Saul, the son of Saul, because of the oath of the Lord, which was between them, between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. So, what happens is that we, it appears that there were seven of the relatives of Saul that were most involved or in the most greatest leadership of the, of the slaughter and death of many of these Gibeonites. So they basically ask an eye for an eye is what they're asking. And they say, all right, there were seven ringleaders from the house of Saul that caused the death of many of our people. So we're asking for seven of them back who are going to pay, pay with their life for what they did. So David says, okay, only exception is you can't have Mabithashef. And they said, okay, because again, it was an oath. David could not break his oath, just like the oath was broken to the Gibeonites, but he won't break his oath, and they honor, the Gibeonites honor that. So, okay, you made an oath, so that's okay. So that's what occurs there. And it's a life for a life. Uh, certainly we know in Numbers 35, 31, it talks about a life for a life. So <clears throat> what happens then, let's, let's go back to our text. in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. And we go back and we see here about this guy Ziba. You see him in verse 2? Mm -hmm. There was a servant of the house of Saul, his name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he says, Yes. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone from the house of Saul, that I can show kindness to, uh, Ben Chesed, the word Hebrew there, and, and Ziba said, there is still a son, as we well know. Now, what we find here is this guy named Ziba. And it's interesting because he is apparently the servant manager of the uh, her hereditary property of Saul. Remember in Israel, once you inherit an area, you may lose it temporarily for debt or some other reason, but at the very least, at the Jubilee year, it comes back to you. So you never permanently lose it. Therefore, despite what Saul did, despite the fact he's dead, and everybody but this one grandson is dead. Still, that is his property. And apparently he was years ago, a servant somewhere in the household of Saul. And therefore he's been the manager, the caregiver, the maintenance man, the whatever you want to call it for this property in the tribe of Benjamin in this area. Make sense? You understand? Okay. Now, it's interesting, though, something about him that I think is very important, and that is when you trace down his name in Hebrew, it got, comes to a Hebrew root word of soba or zoba. It can be either said either way. Now, the thing that's interesting is that's connected historically to a territory. And let me read it to you because we read it yesterday, or I'm sorry, last week, not yesterday, but last week. Verse 3 of chapter 8, and then David defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of 
Soba. Mm -hmm. So his name is connected to a territory, and that territory is north of Damascus. Therefore, it's pretty, I think, confident to say that Ziba is not a Jew. Right. He's a Gentile. Mm -hmm. He was used for apparently his abilities by King Saul to manage his property. Mm -hmm. And despite the death of Saul, he's continued to manage mm -hmm. his property, even though the actual technically legal owner, mm -hmm. that would be Mabithesheth, is not living there in that territory. Okay, he's living somewhere else. Okay, now, um, now David, of course, has not been aware for probably a good 20 years as to where Mobithesheth uh, uh, is, is, or literally, I think probably asking, is he alive? Is he still around? And of course, the answer Ziba gives him is, yes, I know where he is. And it's, he says uh, there in verse um, four, he says he's being predicted by, the, by what he calls the house of Mekir. Mekir was a prominent family in the tribe of Manasseh. And if you remember, where did the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Gad, on the other side. Right. On the other side of Jordan. Exactly. They were in what we call the Transjordan area. Remember, they asked Moses when they came for the conquest, they saw these pasture lands on the east side of the Jordan. And when they asked him, well, can we settle here and take this land? Mm -hmm. And Moses asked the Lord, the Lord said, yes, as long as they promise for the seven year conquest that they'll be with you the whole time. And they, and they did. Mm -hmm. So after seven years, yeah, then Joshua said, you're free to go back home. So that's where they go. But this is a area that was very, that strongly supported Saul as king. And it's an area where, if you remember, when after Saul dies, his one son flees to this area for protection there against the Philistines. And in the same way, this is where they take this young man to uh, keep him safe, possibly from the Philistines, but more likely from any elements of the Gibeonites. Mm -hmm. Because remember, tribal groups in the ancient Near East, and it's still true in the modern Near East, are absolutely preoccupied with blood feuds. Blood feuds, blood feuds, <coughs> blood feuds. If you harm someone in my group, I'll harm someone in your group. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to this very day. And this is what was going on undoubtedly with the Gibeonites also. So he is protected. So he is the, as we know, the grandson of Saul. And we find that in verse five, and David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, uh, and, and it says he then transports him to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, what do you think uh, Mephibosheth probably felt as he was being transferred to Jerusalem? He's going to kill him. He's going to kill him. I'm toast. Okay. He undoubtedly was thinking of all the things that his grandfather did to David, which was a whole lot of misery for 10 years, okay? Mm -hmm. He thinks also, remember the tradition, when a monarchy falls uh -huh. and a new monarchy takes its place, what is the first thing that ends up happening? Kill the whole Kill family. the last king. The exactly. Family. Exactly. Kills all the relatives of the previous king. So for several reasons, I'm certain as he was being transported, he probably didn't have his best night's sleep. <laughs> and of course, he comes and stands before King David. But actually, quickly, he back. falls before yeah. King David mm -hmm. in verses six and seven. And interestingly, David says several things to him. He reassures the young man 
by number one, saying that he won't execute him. He's safe. He's going to be protected. Number two, he will bless this young man because of this promise to Jonathan. Number three, he will restore all of his grandfather Saul's land to him. And number four, he also will help provide for him, David will, by both protection in Jerusalem and also providing the king's best food. Now, does this not give you the impression of an unbelievable level of grace? It's an unbelievable story. Isn't it amazing how so many pastors and teachers in the church today say that the Old Testament is God dealing with the law in Israel, and the New Testament is God dealing with the church and grace? You hear it all the time. Time. Well, Except, also exactly. Mm -hmm. But what they're saying is only partially true. Because grace was shown to begin with at least as early as Abraham. Okay, we'll mention that in a minute. All the way through the Torah, all the way through the rest of the entire Old Testament, and then it is shown even more broadly and more clearly in its focus in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then how God's grace was shown then to the church, to the apostles, etc. Mm -hmm. But God's grace has been from the beginning and will never end. Okay? So it's untrue when people somehow imagine that there's no appreciation of grace in the Old Testament. Well, mm -hmm. shame on them. There's absolutely a ton of it. Mm -hmm. So, now, um, let me just mention two things. You can turn here if you want to. I want to go to Ephesians 1, and I just want to show you, or, or if you don't want to turn this, fine, I'm going to read it. I'm going to Ephesians 1, and I want to read a couple verses. Because here's the application of God's grace. Ephesians, <laughs> except they turn to Galatians, okay. Ephesians chapter one, starting verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, grace, okay, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Who did he choose before the foundation of the world? He says us. Mm -hmm. Now, he's speaking specifically to the church, but... I will tell you, and I'm going to show you later in, on in this teaching, well, I think that he's not just talking about the church. He's, he's, talking, about about, Christ. he's talking about Christ, mm -hmm. who is the Messiah, who is the king of who? Mm -hmm. The Jews. Okay? I think it's the blessing. This is where God showing us here in its application in the New Testament, the blessing that he had planned for everyone Okay, in the kingdom from the very beginning of time. Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. And he says in verse 5, he predestined us as adoption of sons to Jesus Christ to himself, through the kind of tension of his will, to the praise and glory of his what? Grace, Grace. Mm -hmm. which he freely bestowed on us in who? The beloved. the beloved. And then he goes on and talk talks the rest of the chapter about more and more examples of his gifts and his blessings. And it's all about how he lavishes this on us. So, as we said, uh, this young man, of course, was shocked, undoubtedly, at this point, and again falls down and prostrates himself on the ground. He calls himself one who's undeserving i.e. a dead dog, okay? 
Uh, and of course, he has, he just cannot believe that he would receive this kind of blessing and merit because of a promise that occurred years and years and years ago. Now, think about that. We also receive blessing because of several different promises that were given years and years and years ago. You know, we should keep our promises. David is keeping his promise, okay? Saul did not keep his promise, and it, he was judged because of it, but it also is an application to our life, and that is we also should keep our promises. God expects us to do that. True? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's read verses 9 through 13 in chapter 9. Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belonged to Saul, to all his master's house, I have given to your master's grandson. Now, you want to give me your impression of what you think maybe Ziba was thinking? Well, this Gentile servant. No way. Oh, Ziba. Yeah. What do you think he was thinking? Now, remember, he spent probably 20 years taking care of Saul's estate. Oh, you livestock. Why well, he's not giving it to me? Right. Right. Say, After years of him doing the work to maintain this property, keep it profitable, work the agricultural fields, raise whatever animals that were with it, David makes an announcement. Hey, you know all this property you and your family have lived on and benefited from all these years and worked hard to do. I'm giving it to this guy. All right. I think that it's very he light. He turns it around later, I think. Well, it? very good. We're going to get to that. That is very true. So, <clears throat> now, this, of course, is quite a demotion, right? A significant demotion. And, of course, uh, we find that, that he's going to continue to work the land. He's going to continue with his sons and his servants to work and produce all the different agricultural products, etc. Except they're going to be shared between his family and this young man, okay, Saul's grand, uh, Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth. Uh, I'm sorry, I just said his wrong again. His name wrong again, Mephibosheth. Okay, now. One thing we want to notice in this, and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 20, if you would. We, as human beings, are preoccupied with things being fair. Hmm. It is amazing how much time people fuss and get upset about and get mad about the idea that something isn't fair. Not terrible. You know, um, we have... Life is not fair. Yeah. No, well, ever. I know. But at the same time, you notice how much talk, gossip, mm -hmm. you name it, goes on in life about someone being upset that something isn't fair. It's constant. Yeah. Matter of fact, we have right now going on in our culture the idea of the, quote, social justice movement. Yeah. What's it all about? Make everyone equally poor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good comment. Yeah, that would be accurate. She said. Uh, but, but they're trying to make up for slavery. Right. They're trying to make up for slavery. They're trying to somehow make up for the Japanese that were harmed. And right. Ma you know, make up for the Native Americans okay. who 
who frankly, if I would pick a group right. that I would think maybe deserves it the most, I would think it would be them, in my opinion, it's just my, my opinion. opinion too. Okay. Back too. But at any rate, this is the whole drumbeat of, quote, justice, fairness. Now, so, chapter 20, starting in verse 1. This is fairness in the kingdom of God, okay? For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed, and when they had agreed, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day's work, yeah. he sent them to the vineyard. And he went out in the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. <laughs> And to those, he said, you too go out in the vineyard. In other words, we need more workers. And whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And again, he went out in the sixth hour. And then in the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, this would be probably 5 p.m., okay? He went out and found others standing by. And he said to them, why have you been standing there all day long? They said, well, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you too go into the vineyard. And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, and here's the key, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. That's the emphasis of this story. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more. Now, what did they contract into? A denarius. A denarius. Okay. All right. And they also received each one a denarius. Verse 11. And when they received it, they grumbled up to the landowner, saying, These last men who worked only one hour, you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Verse 13, and he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and, and go your way. But if I wish to give to the last man the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do with what I wish, do what I wish with what is my own, or is your eye envious? jealous because I am generous. And then the whole key to the story is verse 16. And the last shall be first and the first last. Okay. Methibosheth was last. He was the dead dog. Through the grace and the promise of King David, he made him first. And he took the, the, the little he had, undoubtedly, and turned over his grandfather's holdings of land and property to him and, quote, made him first. David did that. Now, Ziba, of course, undoubtedly is not very happy about this. Okay? Now, verse 11, Ziba, the Gentile, of course, is still benefited by this. Do you see that? Just like the man that received a denarius that worked 12 hours, he still got a day's wage to feed his family. But the landowner decided to give the last man who needed a denarius for his own family as much as the man that worked first, decided to give him the denarius too. Okay? But... Ziba still had an arrangement where he was making good living off of this Israelite land. He was protected by the Israelite king, okay? And, of course, and as a result, he, he received his own chesed, his own grace, his own kindness from the king. True? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, keep all these things in mind because I'm going to pull them all together at the end, okay? Now, Mephibosheth had, of course, a young son. His name was Micah, 
And he also lived and was protected by the king. If you want to keep your hand there in, no, don't keep your hand in Matthew, go back. Uh, but go in the Old Testament again to, to 1 Chronicles 8. We learn more information about this in 1 Chronicles 8. It's a story that's enumerated about the Benjamites in 1 Chronicles 8. And it starts in verse 34. And the son of Jonathan was Marib Baal. That is another name for Mebethesheth. Uh, that's all. That's who it is. He just has another name also. First Chronicles eight, starting in verse thirty-four. Okay, and he became the father of Micah. Mm -hmm. Right? You see it. Mm -hmm. Notice that it goes on. And Micah has sons: Pithon, Malak, Teriah, and Ahaz. And then it talks about their children. Okay, and I don't, I'm not have to go through all the names, but then you find out at the bottom in verse 40 that as a result, this clan of Micah, the son of Jonathan's son, okay, has 150 relatives that come from it. Wow. Now, it's interesting though, not only does he have 150 relatives that come from it, but in verse 40, I'll read it to you, and the sons of Elam of this clan were mighty men of valor, archers, and had many sons and many grandsons, 150, and they were all the sons of Benjamin. So what you read here is that Moshebeth's son, Micah, ends up having all these relatives. They are leading men in the area of this of this Benjamin. They are mighty warriors and archers here. And as we read further, and I'm not going to go into all the further, there are, there are other places you can learn about this too, this history. But they are important people in Israel all the way to the time of the Babylonian exile. Okay? They're prominent people until the exile. Now, <clears throat> I want to tell you that everything that we've just studied in the story, of course, we see in verse 11 that Ziba, this Gentile manager, said to the king, according to all that my Lord King commands his servant to do will be done. And so uh, Mephibosheth ate at the king's David's table as one of the king's sons. And of course, it mentions in verse 12, that he has a young son, as we just read, his name was Micah, who lived also uh, in the house or Ziba and his servants were, and of course, this whole story of grace. Now, it's an interesting history, but I think it's more than a history. I think embedded through this whole thing is another prophetic typology. So I'll try to make it clear to you. See if this makes sense. David, of course, is typological of Messiah, mm -hmm. who shows this great chesed, nice. grace, mercy, to both a Jewish man, Mephibosheth, and to a Gentile man, Ziba. Mm -hmm. Following me so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the Jewish man was exiled from his original property. Remember, he had to live in the Transjordan for years from his historical property, just like the Jews, the, 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 the Jewish man's relatives were exiled, especially in 70 AD from their property. Okay. Now, this Jewish man lives a long time outside his intended tribal land. And of course, he ends up being hunted by his enemies, that is, the Gibeonites, of course, are after uh, Mephibosheth. These are the enemies. Also, we know 
that the Jews had their many enemies, okay? That is, if you, you don't have to turn here, but I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy 28. It's that very famous chapter that talks about the cursings mm -hmm. and the blessings. Mm -hmm. Remember it? Mm -hmm. And here's one of the um, here's one of the curses. It's in uh, 2837. He says of the Jews, he says, you shall become a horror and a proverb and a taunt among all the people where the Lord will drive you. Therefore, when they are driven out of the land, they have constant, terrible, persistent persecution. That is, that's the definition in Matthew, uh, Matthew, in Deuteronomy 28, 37 of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is promised by God among his people because of their constant betrayals of him. Now, as the Jews, after the exile in 70 AD, as they're exiled in 70 AD, they end up moving, as I said, from country to country and nation to nation. And each time accusations are made about them, stories are told about them, and they end up being persecuted until they finally leave. I have studied the persecution of the Jews and their movement, especially since the 12th century AD. And you'll find that in the 12th century, a very large portion of them were in Portugal. But the Roman Catholic Church, in league with the king and queen of Portugal, finally decided that they were not loyal citizens and frankly, too prosperous and making too much money, as the Jews did repeatedly. And so they caused great persecutions on the Jews, which caused them to be exiled in Spain. And they were there for a while until the king and queen of Spain, exiled them out of with the Catholic Church, okay, decided they were too prosperous, and that they were somehow harming their Gentile neighbors, they would, they would accuse them of several things. One of the things they would accuse them of is what they called host desecration. They would claim that the Jews would sneak into the Catholic Church at night. They would take the host bread that was used for, for Catholic Mass and they stab it repeatedly with a knife. Host desecration. Okay? They also accused the Jews of kidnapping and capturing their children who they would sacrifice on an altar somewhere. This was, I mean, every country just went through the same type of accusation. They were kicked out of Spain. They went to France. The same thing happened in France. They were eventually kicked out of France. They went to Germany, okay? Most of them ended up, of course, because of the persecution, they ended up then, some of them stayed, some of them didn't, and a large portion of them were kicked out from Germany into Poland, and also the countries in the Eastern European areas, until the same thing happened again. And finally, a large portion of them sought refuge in Russia, where, of course, they were again persecuted. Mm -hmm. Of course, pogroms occurred, until finally a significant portion of them emigrated to the United States. And this was the first place that body of them, although all of them certainly didn't come, but those that did immigrate to the United States, of course, found sanctuary and protection in the United States. But, so, while, of course, Mephibosheth was exiled, Zeba replaces him in the Benjamite territory and prospers. This, I think, is equivalent with what we call the Gentile Church Age. That is, while the Jews are gone from their, from their intended land, a Gentile group takes over that land and is prosperous in it. And of course, I think that 
this is, I think, prophetically significant of the Gentile church until, of course, the Jewish man returns finally to his proper place. That is the time we call June, sorry, June, May of 1948, when he finally returns to his original territorial home. Right? Now, it's interesting that, that uh, when the, the Jewish man returns to his original home, in, this t- in his original territory that was given to him, he doesn't return to live in his territory, specific territory, that is, of the area of Benjamin, but rather he is returned to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay? With David. And lives there with David in this area around the city of David. In the same way that Finally, after this long period of exile from his territory, the Jews end up, as a result of a persecution war against them in 1967, regaining Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years. I think another typology here. Now, also, something else we need to learn, and that is, In this story, we find later that David experiences a rebellion by his son Absalom, okay? And, of course, he ends up having to flee Jerusalem. We'll study this in a few weeks. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Of course, eventually Absalom was killed. Now, interestingly, and I want you to turn here, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 16. Nope, went too far. Second Samuel chapter 16. Because this, a very interesting thing happens. Uh, David is on the run because Absalom is trying to kill him and, and the country is divided between those loyal to David and those loyal to Absalom. And in chapter 16, starting in verse 1, Now, when David had passed a little beyond the summit, behold, who? Ziba ends up, the servant of Babithasheth, met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them were 200 loaves of bread, and 100 clusters of raisins, and 100 summer fruits, and a jug of wine. Verse 2, and the king said to Ziba, Why do you have these? Aziba says the donkeys are for the king's household to ride, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink. Verse 3, then the king said, And where is your master's son? That is, Mabithashef, okay? And Aziba said to the king, Behold, he's staying in Jerusalem. For he said, he's supposedly quoting Mabithashef, for he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. Okay? Uh, Either that's an amazing statement or it's a terrible lie, and we're going to see, okay? And then therefore, because Ziba tells David this, look what David does. So the king said to Ziba, behold, all that belongs to Mabithasheth is yours. And Ziba said, I prostrate myself. Let me find favor in your sight, O Lord, the king. All right? Now, let's figure this out. Let's turn now to... Get my page, my notes here. I'm sorry. Turn to my page. We want to turn now to 2 Samuel 19. A few more chapters over. 2 Samuel 19. And we want to go down to verse 24. Now, this is the time. Of course, there's still disorder in the kingdom at this point. Absalom is still 
making misery for David. Start in verse 24. Then Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet David the king. And he had neither, and this is talking about himself, he had, he had neither cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day that the king departed until the day that he came home in peace. So what's the saying about Mephibosheth? It's mourning the fact that David's not there. Exactly. That David's out being persecuted by Absalom and is not in Jerusalem. And he's been mourning it all the time David's been gone. Verse 25. And it was when he came from Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mobithosheth? So he answered, O oh Lord, the king, my servant, deceived me. For, for uh, he says, for, uh, for your servant said, okay, he's now referring to Ziba, okay, your servant said, I will saddle donkey for myself. They may ride on it and go with the king because your servant is lame. Moreover, he has slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king, is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your sight. So he, he straightens out the situation, explaining to David that Ziba's lied, mm -hmm. that, that Mobibosheth was the one that actually saddled the donkeys put all the food on to send to the king, but Ziba took it over, left him in Jerusalem, and took it out to David, declaring, you know, Mabithasheth has betrayed you, but it's not true. So look at what happens now in verse 28. He says, And all my father's household was nothing but dead men before my lord the king, yet you set your servant among those who and that so that I ate at your own table, what what right do I have yet that I should be complained to anyone to the king about anything to the king? So the king said to him, What what will you why do you still speak of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. Okay? Now think about that. He's now decided that both Ziba's relatives and Mobithashef's relatives will divide the land. Okay? That is, he will bless both the Gentile heir family and also the Jewish heir family. Turn, if you would, to a passage you know of, but we need to read it, to Romans chapter 11. Starting verse 11, I'm going to read a few verses. I say then, did they not stumble so as to, as to fall, did they? May it never be. That by their transgression, he's talking about the Jews now, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Hmm. Did we read about a jealous person who's a Gentile before? Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world, who attained a lot of wealth and benefit as a Gentile? Ziba, right? Okay. And their failure be riches for the Gentiles. That is, the failure of the house of Saul caused Ziba's household to be enriched. Correct? He says, how much more will their fulfillment be? I'm speaking uh, to you uh, who are Gentiles in as much as that I am apostle to the Gentiles. He says, if somehow I should move, be moved to jealousy by a fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection, that is the Jews, be the reconciliation of the world, what will be their acceptance be but life from the dead? In other words, the Jews are going to have a future life from the dead. That life partially occurs when they finally get their land back 
their historical heritage, but also it's going to occur in another way too. They're going to get their life finally back when they finally recognize their Messiah and accept him as their Lord and King. But that'll be a much smaller group. That will be a smaller group, true. Now, here's the key, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and become partaker of them, of the rich root of the olive tree, what did we just say? David finally said, the inheritance will be split between both of you, right? The original house of Saul inheritance of the original Israel, but then the grafted in Gentile family of Ziba. Make sense? Okay. And then he says, don't be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And you will you will then uh, say then branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but rather fear. OK. And of course, drop down to verse 25, really the conclusion of this. For I do not want you, to, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come, and thus all Israel will be saved. Okay? So, I think it's, I think it's uh, interesting in this typology I think a lot of people look at <clears throat> all Israel and think the whole group will be saved, but it's going to be such a small group. It will be a, a maybe a third a or a little bit more a than a third, a remnant. So, again, in the parallel, in the typology, Israel, as evidenced or shown by Mobithesheth, is temporarily displaced and loses benefits of the land to the Gentile caretaker, that is, the church. But the Gentile caretaker, the church, isn't completely honest and is jealous such that the king wants to restore control of the ancient lands eventually back to Israel. Messiah King, of course, we see in his dealings, chastises both the the, uh, uh, the 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 Jews and also the Gentile family and the kingdom is split between both the Gentile and the Jewish peoples being both recipients of God's chesed or wonderful grace. Of course, all Israel will be surprised one day when they do, as we said, acknowledge their savior and that they'll be surprised to see and understand eventually that it's the Gentiles that also played a portion in their own redemption, just like Ziba did in the restoration of the lands of Saul. So, remember, in Genesis 12, verse 3, we have this very early great covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And what does it say? It says that God will bless his descendants, the Jews, Abraham being called the first Jew, okay? But also it says the blessing will extend to, quote, all the families of the earth. That is the Gentiles also. Mm -hmm. Now, you decide for yourself, but I think this is a typology. The elements of it would seem to be very <clears throat> oddly there. It all lines up. It all lines up if it were a typology. Again, what do we see? As we study the Word of God, embedded in it is prophetic information that's both historically true, but will also be fulfilled in the future in God's will. So, already? He has a plan. He has a plan. He has a plan.
Okay. Michael, will you pray again for us? We'll close. I will. Tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. Uh, you told us, Lord, to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you for the efforts yes. that our brother puts in every week, Father, to study and to bring out these truths that sometimes we read over top of. And we pray you just help us, Lord, to recognize that uh, in your word, Father, is, is a map for our lives and a, and a plan of salvation that is so vast and beyond us that it's hard for us to even take it all in. Yeah. We just pray you just go with us now throughout, throughout this week. Remember all the requests that have been made here this evening. Especially pray for our brother Mikey and, and mm -hmm. Ann. God, just be with them, Father, as they go on to doctor's appointments and uh, to try to investigate what all can be done, Father, in this situation. And we'll certainly praise you and thank you for everything in Jesus' Amen. name.